the time here. Uh, so I'll just get started uh, and I'll briefly introduce uh, Sain and uh, of course, and then hand it over to you. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Pranita and I welcome you all on behalf of Sain for this Power Our Biotech series. I will briefly introduce Sign for the benefit of those who are not aware of Sign. Uh, Sign is a technology business incubator hosted by IIT Bombay and provides start to scale support to startups, innovators, and entrepreneurs. Uh, and under this Power Our Biotech series, uh, we have tried to you know uh, get the experts uh, uh, to deliver the uh, uh, deliver the session on various topics related to different domains of biology uh, to address recent advances, startup opportunities, funding available for life sciences. Uh, it could be agri-tech, food tech, med tech, healthcare, uh, industrial biotechnology as well. Uh, and also we'll be conducting few sessions on uh, regulatory uh, procedure for devices as well as quality management standards and all that. So moreover, today we are going to talk about medical device standards overview, uh, that is ISO 13485 for medical devices, which is very relevant. And uh, for this session, we have invited Dr. Sanjay Joshi. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sanjay, who is also an IIT Bombay alumni. Dr. Sanjay is a senior director of software with two decades of product development experience in the medical device industry. And he's currently with, uh, working with Globus Medical, where he has uh, served multiple leadership roles in design, development, and launch of innovative products, including Excelsior's GPS surgical navigation robotic system for spine and cranial surgeries, uh, as well as Excelsior's 3D uh, intraoperative X-ray CT imaging system. Earlier, he also worked with GE Healthcare for more than a decade on MRI scanners for whole body and extremities. Uh, Sanjay has led uh, implementation of best practices for software engineering, lean quality management system, and good documentation practices. And he has been coaching cross-functional products teams on agile development. His passion includes scalable software, architecture, applied statistic, and data science. As I've already mentioned, he's an IIT Bombay alumni. He has done his BTEC from electrical engineering from IIT Bombay and PhD. Uh, he earned his PhD in electrical engineering from University Maryland, Baltimore and MBA from Market University, Wisconsin. And he's currently based near Boston, USA. And he's been very kind, you know, uh, giving us this opportunity where we can facilitate this session. Uh, so with this introduction, I welcome Dr. Sanjay Joshi for this session. Uh, before I hand this session to over, over to you, Sanjay, I just want to inform our audience that we will take the question towards the end of the session. Uh, attendees can put their questions in Q&A chat box or raise their hands during Q&A and we will unmute them so that you can ask your question to Dr. Joshi. Uh, so, I, uh, so welcome, uh, Sanjay, and I hand this session over to you so that you can take this forward. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Pranita. It was uh, my honor. To, uh, uh, to come and speak at this event. You know, I mean, you guys are doing great work and this is just you know, my little contribution to the whole endeavor. And thank you for the uh, kind introduction. So we'll dive into agenda uh, of the meeting. So uh, first off, you know, why do we care about standards? Uh, they are, you know, typically we'll hear, uh, hear the word ISO or IEC. Uh, they are used by multiple regulatory agencies. In India, it is CDSCO. In the US, it is FDA. In Japan, it is PMDA. And in the European Union, it's the European Medicines Agency. So there are a lot of standards that you will hear. And I have listed five of those that are most commonly used. And out of these, today we are going to look at the high level overview of ISO 13485. Almost always, that is the first standard uh, that you, know, you will hear or implement uh, in your organization. Uh, US FDA has a slightly different code called uh, QSR quality system regulation and there are some minor differences and I will quickly touch upon those because I think uh, what they bring is a little clarification of what ISO 13485 uh, wants you to do. So with that, a uh, little bit about myself, I think Dr. Pranita has already covered uh, most of the stuff on this slide. Uh, the last part is uh, uh, with all my career, I, it was uh, a great opportunity to get a full life cycle experience of medical device development. You know, there are some products where I got involved uh, right from concept definition. Uh, most of them I went through uh, design and development. 
uh, including testing, verification, and validation. Uh, we took the products through manufacturing. Uh, once they were in the field, uh, you know, with our service uh, uh, procedures or service application, uh, there are a couple of opportun uh, uh, instances, unfortunate, where I was also involved in leading the safety recall. Uh, and also with that came uh, design changes. So I hope, you know, in this talk, I'm sharing what I learned. Uh, I hope you can, uh, you know, uh, you can take advantage of it. If you have any questions, as Dr. Pranita, Pranita said, we will uh, take them up at the end. So to get started, uh, uh, the Oftentimes you might hear this uh, conception. It is really a misconception that standards are necessary evil. So I wanted to dispel two things right away. Uh, first of that is it is not necessary. I don't think any country's regulatory agency says that you have to comply with any of these standards. Having said that, complying with these standards will make your life much easier. And that I think is the primary driver uh, for, the, uh, for the standards. And secondly, they're not evil. You know, they were created for a good reason and they're actually created to make your life easy, to help you. And that's what we are going to look at uh, uh, in the rest of the presentation. In my mind, uh, standards are really best practices and uh, they are created to help you. Uh, now, uh, you will hear different bodies, you know, uh, I don't know if you can see my screen. Let me see if I can minimize this window there we go uh, you will see different standard bodies uh, and uh, some of them are very heavily involved on the technical side for example ieee or ul and there are some bodies that are uh, involved at a slightly higher level and uh, typically iso and ic uh, they are international organizations there are experts on the board the experts come from industry from governments and they create these standards and uh, you know if you read a standard you might sometimes feel that this is too vague you know how how am i supposed to implement this and that's exactly the question i asked to a, a us fda officer uh, when i met him at a conference and his answer was very interesting and he said that these are vague on purpose uh, because they leave you the flexibility to implement them the way you see fit because you know how much you know how many resources you have people money you know, uh, facility, whatever. And you know your product better than anybody else. So you decide what makes sense for you and you implement it. You know, what we care is you do a thorough job and that's exactly where uh, the standards help. In my mind, uh, you know, there is something called the start of fatigue when, you know, you are constantly under observation, under the gun that, oh, did you do this? Did you do that? And, you know, there are a lot of business things that you have to take care of, uh, technical challenges in product. Uh, and at appropriate milestones, the standards help you uh, by forcing you to rise a mile high and take an interview of the landscape. You know, where are you in the big picture? You know, what phase are you in the product development? What phase are you in manufacturing service? You know, are you paying attention to the things that you should be paying attention to? <clears throat> so the usage in medical devices, I roughly break it up into two parts. Uh, so the first one is the processes or procedures used in the organization. And the 13485 standard is the quality management system standard, and that is not per product, it is per your organization. Now, having said that, there are some components of 13485 that you will be doing as part of your product documentation. Um, but you know, mo uh, when you get certified, you get certified as an organization for 13485, not per product. There are other standards that help you with checks and balances for each product. And some of those are 14971, which is risk management, where you are documenting what could go wrong with your device and what are the mitigation in case something goes wrong. Uh, there is a standard 62366 for usability, which says that you need to talk to the end user and you know learn from them how do they how they will use the product, where they will use it, so on and so forth. Now, depending on what your product has, there are other classes of standards that apply. For example. Uh, if your product includes any software or firmware, uh, the software development lifecycle standard or 62304 uh, will be applicable. If there is any electromechanical parts in your device, uh, then the 60601 family of standard, it is not one standard, it's actually 
6060-1-2-4-6 there are multiple standards you know as necessary they will become applicable uh, depending on what your device has for example if it has a laser light there is a different standard to comply with if it has x rays there is a different standard to comply with and again that changes device by device you know it's uh, uh, it's really uh, and that is why certification to those standards is by device not by organization uh, now you will hear a lot of stuff in this presentation and if there are if you really want to summarize it on one slide this is the slide so this is 13485 what i call the tldr summary and there are only three things you need to take away from this presentation number one is say what you do and the standard will tell you what all things you need to say uh, the second thing is then to do what you say you know you actually you know whatever you said you got to do it and the third part, and this is where the auditors come in, you need to have evidence that you actually did what you said. It's as simple as that. Now, when you do all this, you have to use common sense. You know, what makes sense for your organization, for your people, for your product. And what you are building, the ultimate goal of what you are building is your product, not the quality management system. So do not let the process or the procedure overwhelm you. You need to focus on your product. These are just checks and balances to make sure you are covering everything when you, want, when you focus on the product. And this is really it. I mean, uh, I love the movie uh, Kung Fu Panda, where there is no secret ingredient. When you look at successful medical devices companies, when you are you see successful entrepreneurs, great products, safe products, that's all they do. They say what, you, uh, what they do, they do what they say, and they have evidence that they did what they said. So coming to 13485 standard, uh, it is for the whole organization and it's very much like ISO 9001, you might, which you might have heard of. Uh, it is tuned for medical device companies or medical device products. Uh, as I said, the certification is not required for regulatory agencies, uh, but if you do have certification, it will help get approval from regulators. And the reason for that is they are oftentimes checking for almost exactly the same thing that the standard will ask you to do. And that's why it makes your life easier. Uh, so the next, naturally the next question is certification. So ISO as an organization does not certify any, any particular organization, but there are a lot of third party companies that do certification uh, that can provide you even the baseline material. The best resource for those are uh, usually your incubators like IIT B sign or you know any other incubators you might be working with or even your colleagues you know other people who are in the same boat as you are the other thing uh, the standard does or compliance to the standard does it is shows a certain level of credibility that could be to your investors who are you know giving you funding uh, it could be your suppliers and do not underestimate the importance of suppliers because they are what keeps your manufacturing pipeline running and when the suppliers know that you are compliant with 13485, they are, you are going to ask all these questions. And uh, you know, if, uh, you know, it's always a good idea to establish a level of trust with your suppliers. Uh, this becomes important to your potential buyers of your company. If you plan to get acquired by someone else, and if they come come to you, they want to see what you are doing. And if you show that you are already 13485 compliant or you have everything that you need for 13485, they definitely will be impressed. And lastly, it's customers. You know, ultimately, it's the product that you are selling. And if your users feel that the product they are uh, buying is a quality, safe product, it definitely builds credibility. Most of 13485 is implemented with standard operating procedures or SOPs. And there are some parts where you actually have to document on a per device. And we'll cover that later in this slide. <clears throat> so there are five main components of what 13485 wants you to do. And we will take a look at each of these uh, in this uh, presentation. So we start with section four, which is a general requirement for quality management system. And this is, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, the standard wants you to set up a QMS. Uh, they want you to maintain records. Now, uh, if you outsource some activity or some part of the activity to third party, it is still, you are still responsible. Ultimately, that's where the buck stops. Uh, so if you outsource, that's totally fine as long as you monitor it. Now, sometimes you might end up using some software application uh, for QMS activities, this could be for tracking document, for storage, retrieval, 
could be for electronic approvals. If you use those, that's totally fine. You have to validate them first before you use them. Uh, because what you don't want is to assume that, you know, just because it's a software that you downloaded or you bought, uh, it just works. You know, the, the standards do want you to check that it does what it's supposed to do. What that boils down to is you policing yourself. And that's, uh, that basically builds a certain level of discipline in the organization. So naturally, the next question, and you are going to face this question at many stages in your product development is do you make something or buy something and that totally applies to the QMS. Uh, you can totally make your own, write your own SOPs or you could just buy them. Either ways it works, you know, just do what makes sense for you. Most of the companies that I have seen, they end up buying because it just takes too much time to write documentation. And I know you, all of you have a lot of much more fun and exciting things to do than writing SOPs. Whichever way you go, uh, make sure you review and modify them for continuous improvement because what you get or what you create the first time may not be perfect and it's totally fine. That's why there is revision history table on each of our documents. It comes to documents. So the standard says you document all the procedures and the scope, what exactly they cover. For each device, uh, you need to maintain the documentation of specification, how to install, how to manufacture, and we will cover a little more on design controls. And this part is for device, and you actually need to have that documentation per device. <clears throat> when you control, when you create these documents, uh, you want to write down how do you control them? You know, who reviews them, who approves them, where do you store them after they're approved, and how do you retrieve them from wherever you are stored? So the auditors will most often go after, uh, anytime they see a document, uh, the first thing they are going to check is, is that an approved document? Are you using only approved documents? And the second thing is, are you using the correct version or correct revision? You know, when you used at, at that time, whenever you used it, was that the correct revision of the document? When was it released? For the records of the products, uh, you should maintain them at least for the lifetime of the device. And that's not just how long you are going to manufacture the product, because even after you stop manufacturing, your product is still in the field. Your uh, users are using them and you really need to maintain the record until uh, the, uh, the, the life cycle of the product. And that's something you define per product. You know, what is the lifespan of your product? And these could be subject to future audit, especially if there are complaints from the field. That brings us to section five, which is management responsibility. And the standard, uh, you know, wants you to focus on customers. You know, there is uh, the 62366 standard goes much more into the depth of user experience and usability. But even 13485 wants you to look at uh, what the customers want and what the regulatory uh, wants. It is really important to build a customer relationship uh, early in your uh, in your product development phase. Uh, as a management, you also should define the authority and responsibilities, you know, especially who approves what kind of documents. Uh, there, you need to conduct regular management reviews. Once your product is in the field, uh, you need to start looking at complaints uh, from the field. Uh, and what you need to do, you don't have to look at every complaint in your management review. You, even if you look at the summary of the complaints and dive deeper as needed, that's good enough. Uh, you need to look at regulatory reporting. That's when you initially register the product or you know, uh, submit a product for clearance or anytime there is a complaint that deserves to be reported to the, uh, to the government bodies. Uh, you should look at the audits. If there are action items from the audits, you know, what did you do to the action items uh, that need to be covered. The monitoring of products and processes. This is when something doesn't work. If there are non-conformities or some defects, now they need not happen, you know, at you know, after your device is manufactured or after it is released. That can happen actually while you are designing, development, developing, or creating the product. And lastly, there are corrective and preventive actions, and we'll touch quickly on those uh, towards the end of the slide. So again, you know, what you want to do is you know review all these on a periodic basis. Review what makes sense for your organization at what life cycle your products are in. The next section is resource management. Um, on human resources, uh, they want you to uh, look at the training, education, and skills. And the training, almost in every audit that I have been, uh, anytime they see a person doing something, 
almost always the auditors have asked you know show me the training record for this person and this is this is super important you want to be squeaky clean on this one that you know if somebody is doing something are they trained for it then there are infrastructure in requirements sometimes there may be requirements on your building on the workspace on the equipment and that could include both hardware or software uh, there may be requirements on the work environment uh, you know cleanliness clothing and there may be situations when uh, somebody who is trained needs to work under special uh, conditions and we'll take a look at an example of soldering uh, so on the human resources side uh, you know you might have uh, you know on the training or education this could be on the job training or you might you know as part of the interview you might want to check can the assembler actually solder uh, on the infrastructure requirement, you probably, I mean, it's just a good business practice. You should have controlled entry on who can get in and out of uh, uh, either your development area or your manufacturing or service area. Uh, for the workspace, especially if you are dealing with delicate electronics, you should have electrostatic mats. Uh, now, you may be doing soldering by hand, or you have you may have big industrial machines that do soldering. And I show a wave soldering machine at on the bottom right. And you know, when you have an equipment like that, you know, what do you need for your, uh, for your building to host such an equipment? Uh, are there any cleanliness requirement? Uh, you know, especially once you start talking about these big machines, do you need to wear special suits to operate these machines? Uh, are there high temperature situations? You know, there may be toxic fumes. You can see the, the vent pipes on these machines. Uh, as they go out, you want to get all the gases out of your building. So they may be ruled not just by 13485. This is where the other government standards, like environmental standards, can also become applicable. Section seven is on product realization. Uh, this is what you need to do typically on a per device basis. And uh, this is this is really a big part. And uh, uh, again, it starts with planning. Uh, you know, the standard wants you to create plans before you do something. And this is pretty much uh, the mantra that we follow in almost all the product development that we do. Anytime you undertake an activity, first thing, write a plan. Second thing, do what the plan says. And third thing, summarize that you did what the plan said. So we follow exactly those three steps. Uh, you want to talk check at risk, you know, what could go wrong with the device? You know, what are the risks associated with it? What harm could it cause? And how do you mitigate that harm? Uh, focus on testing, how we're going to make sure that your requirements and the mitigation actually work. Uh, the standard wants you to focus on customer focus, uh, starting with requirements gathering. You know, I show this example of, you know, measurement for eyeglasses, you know, how is, how is that done? You know, is it in, uh, in uh, in a situation where there could be daylight or ambient light, or is it a controlled lighting situation? Uh, is it meant for uh, all people of all ages and head sizes and children, or is it only for children, only for adults? Uh, who does the measurement? You know, uh, is it a trained person? Where do, do they sit? Do they stand? All these come when you discuss these things to your uh, with your end user. So the standard wants you to review the requirement and manage the communication to and from from customers, especially when it comes to usability. It is really important that you document all the interactions you had with your user. And again, you don't need to write down every email or every phone call you had. But there may be at, at certain times you may be doing a lab or you know a demo to the users and you want to write down all that communication. Uh, the big chapter is the design and development of product, and this is typically happens in multiple stages. Uh, and the very first one is planning of these stages, so different development stages. Uh, how are you going to review the uh, what what got done, and who is going to responsible going to be responsible for doing it and approving it? And it usually starts with design inputs. This is where we talk about requirements, uh, either the user level requirements, system level requirements, software requirements and risk management of your device. On the design output, uh, this is the specifications and drawing. If you have electrical or mechanical parts uh, for software, this could be so your software architecture or detailed design documents or even your code. At each of these stage, uh, you should do a design review and make sure that people did what they said they were supposed to do, write down any action and track the closures of those actions. 
uh, design verification stage is where you are ready and now you want to test it. So you want to write down how you are going to test it, the methods that you are going to use. Uh, what is pass or what is fail? What does that mean? You know, typically we write it down as expected results in our verification procedure. What sample sizes you are going to use? You know, sometimes a sample size of one may not be enough. Uh, and usually we write down why a sample size of one is enough if we ever make that claim. Design validation is done with a representative product. Uh, uh, that is something that came out of uh, the prototype or the initial stages of your, uh, of your manufacturing pipeline. Uh, they are usually done by representative users. These could be surgeons, these could be doctors, nurses, you know, whoever is your end user. It could be you know, just regular people if you are creating a device for home use. The design transfer stage is once the product design is complete, you transfer the design or the master record really to manufacturing to make sure that they can make it. Uh, and then the last part is design change. After all this is done, there will be a need. Uh, you know, you might be surprised with that, that you, know, you think that you are putting out a perfect product, but usually there are things that you need to tweak later. Uh, any design change should be reviewed. Most of design change need to be verified. Some of them, especially if those, those changes that affect usability need to be validated. Uh, all design changes need to be approved and all the stages that you see above need to be archived in what we call the design history file. That's the documentation of all records on how your product was designed and developed. So section seven continues on purchasing. Uh, this is where you will do your supplier evaluation and selection. You want, to, if you want to create a stable quality product, you want to have uh, a really a great level of trust with your suppliers and you. And you, you know, this is one place where you don't want to compromise. You know, just because you are, you know, you know, your neighbor's uncle's, uh, you know, son has uh, something. You know, that's not a good enough reason. You know, do they have uh, a quality? Uh, pipeline? Do they have a quality supply chain themselves uh, to create what, what you need? Uh, think how you are going to communicate the purchasing information. You know, if, if it's a mechanical or electrical part, how are you going to send the drawings or specification to them? Uh, you may need to send multiple revisions. And you know, how will you communicate any changes to those revisions? You know, where are you going to define the tolerances? You want to think of all these things when you communicate with your supplier. Make sure you are in agreement. So let's say a supplier makes a part, uh, an assembly or the whole product. Uh, you need to verify that whatever you are purchasing from the supplier actually works. Uh, and this could be with your inspection procedure or a test procedure and always, always, always maintain the records of your testing. Because even like, let's say if you find an issue and you want to go back to the supplier, you need to go with a record that here is what your testing found. And in our example of solder, uh, you know, if you if there is a certain chemical composition that you need, need, for example, it needs to be lead free, you need to write it down or, you know, what is a exact chemical composition of the solder? Uh, does it is it flux free or does it have flux in the center? You know, what's the size of the wire, so on and so forth. You want to write all these things down in the specification. The standard then moves on to production and service. Uh, for everything that you use in your manufacturing process, you know you need to write down what are the documented procedures, what are the tools, who needs to be trained, how do you use those tools, the manufacturing procedure to get it done. Uh, about cleanliness, you know if you mount, is, this is become especially important if you are going to make a sterile uh, device or uh, item. Uh, how do you sterilize that? Or does your customer going to sterilize it? Do you have instructions on how to sterilize? You know, definitely all these come in. If it's a big capital equipment, like the products that I have worked on, almost always there are installation requirements. You know, what kind of power supply do you need? Do you need a special room to host that equipment? And a verification of installation. You know, once you have installed the product, does it work? Does it do what it is supposed to do? And your customer is going to ask, for all those things, show me that what you are delivered actually works. Once your product is in the feed, uh, you typically end up doing preventive maintenance. Uh, you know, sometimes it could be once a year, uh, once uh, twice a year. It depends on what your product needs. Uh, but you should maintain service records, and uh, almost always the 
the supply uh, the auditors will ask for service records anytime you write a process or a procedure uh, for your product make sure you validate the process and it is typically done by the representative user so if it is done let's say that you wrote a procedure for manufacturing something it needs to be your assembler who validate your procedure if it's a service procedure maybe it's your service engineer uh, who validates the procedure <clears throat> next part on uh, 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 on section 7 is identification uh, so it could be a, what is known as a udi a unique device identifier again as needed basis or it could be as simple as serial numbers and it's not just for the whole device it could be even for individual assemblies and it can go down to individual parts it just depends on how important that part is now some parts may have a unique serial number and sometimes like especially if it's a screw or washer or wires instead of assigning a serial number to each of them you could do it by a lot that this is the lot of you know whatever 100 screws or 500 screws that we receive the other part about identification is the status of the product especially if you are maintain if you are creating a sterile product uh, you may want to identify or trace uh, the temperature humidity and the status of sterility uh, throughout your production storage and installation process on the traceability part uh, the standard wants you to trace uh, each component or material that was used uh, if you are using certain parts what revision of the parts uh, were used in your record uh, it goes down to even packaging or labeling you are you going to put serial numbers on the, on the part if so where is the drawing of the of the sticker or the plate that has a serial number what are the requirements on that label you know it should not come off just because you applied some water to it all this becomes important if you have to track down a, an individual product or a batch of products and you know you don't hope you never have to deal with it but there may be situations for a recall and if you don't have this information you'll be in trouble because the natural expectation is everything you have made has a problem the next part is monitoring and measuring equipment this could be as simple as a multimeter you know don't assume that it just works you need to actually get it calibrated the voltage it is measuring is it actually the correct voltage and usually there are uh, third party or there are consulting companies that can do this calibration for you uh, sometimes your device might come back saying that it was actually out of tolerance now it's not always a bad news you know you could say that yes you know it is out of tolerance but it is it error on this side which may not which may be okay for you so you don't have to go back and retest everything uh, that this equipment was used for testing some of these monitoring equipment might be software applications and this is where you need to write down the procedure on how you are going to test that software procedure and this is known as computer system validation or csv the next section in the standard is monitoring and uh, this is a different kind of monitoring the first one is complaint handling so when complaints do come in believe it or not it will happen uh, how do you receive them how do you track them is there a complaint number that you assign uh, well almost all you should evaluate just because you received a communication from someone does not mean it's automatically a complaint they may not have understood how to use your product uh, and you definitely want to do investigation you know what exactly happened and you want to write down everything that you do uh, uh, if there are any corrections or corrective actions you know that needs to be handled with uh, uh, with, with its own procedure now it i hope it never happens but there may be a situation when somebody gets harmed uh, while they are using your product in which case it's considered an adverse event and you will need to report it to the appropriate regulatory bodies now sometimes it may you need you usually have to report it in the country in which it happened and sometimes even if it's not in that country you may have to report it uh, to those countries especially i believe canada is uh, really well known for this that it happens anywhere in the world you need to report it to canada if you are selling product in canada uh, you need to do internal audits uh, they need to be planned uh, with some fixed interval in mind and uh, when we talked about the management responsibilities earlier you know what all the different things you are looking at you know this the audit is was one of them and the audit is really checking are you 
are you sticking to the standard are you doing everything that you said you will do and this could be done by internal team is typically done by the quality assurance team so coming to non conforming product uh, you know sometimes it does happen you know the part you received or the part you make may not actually conform to the specifications that you laid down so what do you do you know you can either fix it to make sure it works again uh you can preclude it from intended use you can still use it for something else uh you know with proper documentation or you can justify like for example the shade of color was just not you know precisely what you wanted but if there is no impact on the product functionality uh it becomes a business decision and that may be okay uh sometimes you may have to uh, rework the part or change the part and if you are doing that uh, you should have a procedure on how to rework now any time there is a procedure or process you have to validate it and you have to show the evidence that all the validation worked correctly any rework you do you should maintain records uh, often time these are pulled in an audit the next part is improvements uh, these could come uh, because of complaints or non conformances or it could be plain simple performance improvement uh, and uh, these usually uh, Uh, you know they may result into a corrective action and preventive action and a quick example of these uh, you might remember a few years ago i think it was 2019 when boeing 737 max had uh, the issue and actually two planes crashed because of the problem uh, so the corrective action part is the eliminating elimination of the cause to prevent recurrence of the same problem and uh, you might remember there was an airflow sensor in the nose of the plane uh and sometimes this would go bad and start reporting incorrect values for airflow how do you handle a defective airflow sensor uh you know that could be a corrective action again i am no expert in boeing on exactly what they did this is just what i thought they might do uh the preventive action is uh now that you know airflow sensors could be defective what other parts could go wrong and if they go wrong could they actually cause something automatically and if they do is there a manual override so the preventive action may be let's say if something else goes wrong in that whole airflow pipeline how will you control it so providing a manual override uh, that you can turn off the automatic uh, you know control and take over a manual that could be a great way a uh, great one for preventive action and this is typically done even before the non conformity has happened so that's it for the sections of iso 13485 uh, we'll get into uh, a special code for us fda it's called 21 cfr which stands for code for federal regulation and the number is 820 and that's the quality system regulation now uh, the us fda has published in it's actually in the process of transitioning from their special code to actually using 13485 as is because they are so similar and there is one small difference and the difference is really some explicit references uh, that the cfr calls out and the 13485 standard does talk about those but it's not that explicit about those and i wanted to highlight those explicit documentation uh, 13485 does actually talk about design history file uh, and how the product was designed so that covers your plans uh, requirements test protocols and actual results the uh, the us qsr goes a uh, two steps further that they say that your design history file should also include your risk management file and that usually you will go to 14971 standard for compliance uh, the second part they want you to do is the usability file and this is what comes uh, from standard 62366 the next part is now that the product is designed how do you create or make units of that product and how do you maintain them and that's where the master record or device master record comes into picture uh, or dmr and this contains the specifications all the drawings if there are assembly procedures that your manufacturing team needs to follow those are listed here uh, any inspection tissue test protocol and whatever you do to service the product they are all part of the master record and third part is the device history record and this is where uh you will talk about how to identify each unit of the final product it could be individual assemblies or the whole product uh traceability of each part uh, that went into creating that unit and any history of maintenance or service that you did on that particular unit so at a high level uh this is what it looks like 
uh, on the whole documentation tree for QMS. So different countries will create their codes and guidances on what you need to do as a medical device manufacturer. The international such organization like ISO, IEC will publish standards. You as an organization need to consume both of these and create SOPs or standard operating procedure that go across all your products. Let's say you have three different products that you are creating. Uh, each product will have its own design history file or DHF. It will have its device master record or DMR on how to make multiple units of that device. And for each unit, it will have it's that unit's own DHR or device history record. So coming to the last slide, uh, this is basically, again, you know, I uh, uh, reusing my slide from earlier, three things that you need to keep in mind. Um, say what you do, do what you say, and always have evidence that says that you did uh, what you said. And this is it. So that's the end of my presentation. So I will stop sharing my screen. And Dr. Pranita, um, over to you yeah. for Q&A. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Sanjay. I mean, it was really informative. Uh, you really gave us an overview of the whole process. Uh, however, before I take up the questions from uh, you know uh, audience here, mm -hmm. uh, I feel that most of the people would like to understand when this process started. And I know that you have covered that it starts from designing. However, most of these startups are innovators. While they are actually you know working on something, they probably start with their PhD or master's thesis mm -hmm. or something like that, right? And while they're doing that, they're not really aware about these management standards however we have been taught about you know keeping the records to certain extent right uh writing the protocols standard operating procedures and all that we are aware however in this case if let's say somebody is taking up their phd work they have make, made something uh you know how they go back and implement something which uh, you know not really started from designing per se uh, how that can happen correct so um you again the, the question i will ask is are you taking the design as is as the result of your phd or master's work and making it into a product maybe you are or maybe you are taking that as a proof of concept that this is what worked and now we need to go to the next level of manufacturing so i will give the example of the surgical robot that we did so it was initially done uh, at uh, university of arizona uh, in phoenix arizona uh, in the midwest and what they really had was the prototype so when we started creating the robot, we literally redesigned it from ground up uh, because we wanted to make sure that the prototype that, that the device that we create a needs to be manufacturable. You know, even if the prototype was easy for you to make, can your suppliers actually make it? Uh, the second part is, uh, is it is it as usable as it could be for your end user? Because the proof of concept oftentimes was great for you. It may not work for your end user. So there may be design changes. And once you start making that into a formal product, uh, you know, usually early on, you should have discussions uh, with your end user. And that's usually where it starts. That, you know, what are the records of your meetings with your users? What are you demoing? And you don't have to control everything that you demo. But if you can start maintaining the records of your interactions with the user, that's the, that's the first one. The second one is uh, once you start gathering requirements for your product, you know, you need to write down the requirements, uh, you know, with an uh, either uh, an ID for each requirement or, you know, maintain a document, have a signature, uh, things like that. Uh, so that's that's early on in the product design where this becomes, uh, you know, again, you can continue to operate even without having 13485 clearance or uh, certification at that phase. Where this becomes important is when you get into design verification and design validation, you know, in order to prepare your product for submission. And this is where you are going to make the first uh, uh, items on your production line. And especially if you are making a hardware device or it has any hardware components, you want to write down what are the specifications. I would say before you start producing something, it is important to uh, uh, to basically either at least have a set of SOPs or at to some extent have control on how you are creating something. Answer your question. 
yeah yeah pretty much yeah thanks thanks Sanjay. even i got the clarity because most of these time startups are at very early stage uh, may not be able to do or maintain uh, as per right. you know they don't have many uh, uh employees or even co-founders or team is very limited so how Absolutely. that could uh so yeah right. thank you thank you and so much actually yeah on that topic you know for example if it's just two or three of you that are maintaining a product i mean come on you know what are you going to discuss and argue <laughs> about a certain process you know it really becomes applicable when you have uh, you know uh, like somebody who is on the test department somebody who is manufacturing you know somebody who is going to do service and this is when it becomes a real and that's usually when it needs to kick off so no you don't need to start worrying about all these things and have a full fledged quality management system from day one that's not required okay thanks uh, so we have a couple of questions in Q&A, a uh, lot of questions in yeah. Q&A chat box. So I'll take it up uh, one by one. So uh, we have one question from uh, Rinki uh, Debre. She's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, she's asking, is this applicable for software for medical devices as well? Absolutely. Because again, it depends on what gets classified as a medical device. And I think there was also a question, Pranita, from... Uh, you know, from the email that you send, it's called SAMD, Software as a Medical Device. So yes, it is a thing. And again, you need to really look at uh, the definition of medical device. Uh, and you, know, you can actually find it on the US uh, 21 CFR 820. It's free access, just look it up. And it defines what a medical device is. If the piece of software that you are creating will be used to treat a patient or to diagnose something, you know, it will be considered a medical device. And again, you know, you really need to look at the wording of, uh, uh, you know, of what constitutes a medical device. And even if it's only software, it can still constitute as, uh, uh, as a medical device. And just on the same line, Sanjay, then what is the standard which will be applicable to it? Uh, I think earlier you mentioned about IEC yes. uh, 62304. Six, exactly. So IEC 62304 is the umbrella standard for software development life cycle. In addition, uh, many government agencies will publish guidances. Uh, they are not binding that you don't have to do it, uh, but you know it's a usually a good idea. And some of those include cybersecurity. So 62304 does not cover cybersecurity, uh, but you, know, you need to consider cybersecurity in design, especially if it's a software only product. And uh, the governments will ask, and even your customers are going to ask. I mean, I answer these uh, customer questionnaires, you know, every week, and they want to know: Have you done penetration testing? Are the vulnerabilities with your product? How do you control open source libraries? You know, third-party software that comes in. So yes, all these are important questions. Okay, thanks. So, uh, Rinki, your question is answered. If you have any other question, please put it in the chat box. Uh, we have another question from Shalaka here. Uh, she's uh, she, uh, she mentioned that uh, they are contract manufacturers for medical devices for various mm -hmm. customers. Uh, they have they don't have their uh, own product. However, they are QMS certified. Uh, yeah. The question is, uh, can we go for ISO 13485? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there is. Uh, you can absolutely go for 13485. And uh, what, uh, in fact, if you do that, you will definitely, you know, raise uh, the credibility that you will have with, uh, you know, potential orders, uh, you know, uh, 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 for your organization. Uh, again, uh, some of these things may not apply. For example, section seven that talks about product design, you're not really designing a product. Right, but you are going to receive the specifications of the product from your customers. So, what you receive, how are you going to store what you receive from the customer? Because even if they they may not send you every revision of the part that you are going to make, they may send you revision five and then revision nine. But you need to have a system where you are going to archive the revisions that as you received from the customer and traceability. Every unit that you made, can you trace it down? Uh, all the components that went into it and they were uh, made to which revision of which specification. So absolutely, it makes a lot of sense to do 13485. It may not, again, you, know, you have to make the decision. Is it 13485 or is it ISO 9001? ISO 9001 may be sufficient in your case, because especially if you are going not going to be specific to medical devices. Got it. 
uh, however they mentioned they are uh, manufacturers of medical yep. devices but on the same line uh, sanjay here uh, another question from my end is that most of the startup goes for these contract manufacturers right they don't mm -hmm. have their own manufacturing facility so, in that case uh, how does it work i mean what kind of a manage uh, uh, standards they have to manage because they are not going to manufacture they probably do give uh, provide the designs to contract manufacturers to do the rest of the thing correctly Absolutely. So usually the way we do it is we always have an approved supplier list. So, I mean, why do you, you know, let's say that you are, say, for sake of argument, like you are not going to buy a USB power, you are not going to make a USB power supply. You are probably going to buy it. It's just not worth making your own. If you go to Amazon or one of the online shops and try to buy one, and if you look at it, uh, this was actually news to me, you will see a UL certification on that unit. You won't believe how many are fake. So, you know, when you go to your supplier, who is your approved? Supplier? That's why you do not want to buy things uh, with an unknown supplier online. You know, you want to write down who your supplier is, you know, what are their certifications? Because as the standard says, ultimately you are responsible for whatever your contract manufacturer makes. So the things you want to write down is who are your contract manufacturers? Do they have their own quality management system? You know, are they actually making the products you want them to make? Because, you know, you definitely want them to trace down material or, you know, make sure that if they are soldering something, they are doing it right. Are they testing what you what they are making or are you testing what they are making? Whichever way is fine. But if you are going to test, here is my test protocol. And whatever I receive from my supplier, here is how I'm going to test it. Here is my test record. If you want them to test, you are still responsible for their test. So you want to make sure, and we actually do... Uh, even in my company, we do outsource a lot of things and our supply chain manager uh, does a supplier audit typically every year when they will visit and it's uh, basically, a, usually it's a friendly audit that they will say, show me the record of units three through six and they will go through the record and inspect. Here is how you verified. Yes, that makes sense. Got it, got it. So it's extremely important that you have quality management system while designing as well as later yes. on for testing. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now we have another question on product withdrawal uh, from mm -hmm. uh, Premanka. Uh, mm -hmm. So Premanka is asking what would be the process in case of product withdrawal? So, uh, Well, I hope the day never comes, but sometimes it does. Uh, usually, almost always, this will involve communication with the regulatory agency. Uh, in the country in which this product is out. And uh, absolutely, you need to have a regulatory person uh, in your team or you need to, you could, it could be even a contract form, but you definitely want to work with the experts because there are nuances in the language when you communicate to the government or any government regulatory agency and they are super critical about those wording. So you definitely want to work with a regulatory specialist on how to communicate the withdrawal. Again, it is, Total, you know, sometimes it just makes sense to do it and, uh, uh, you know, totally, you know, uh, again, I can't comment on exactly what you need to do. It depends on what the product is, what country you are in, uh, anything that you do, maintain the record. Now, I'll give an example. When I was involved in a safety recall, we actually had to track the delivery of the letter to the customer that, you know, when you told them that in, in our case, it was, it was not too crazy. It was, you know, leakage of a certain grease. And we had to tell them that, no, you need to inspect under the device. Is there a leak? And if there is a leak, you know, wipe it or, you know, you can use such and such cleaner and inform us so that we can send a service engineer to repair it. But we had to track the delivery of the record. It was not an email. We had to send it like a physical paper record and trace the delivery of each of the signatures. Right. Right. So I even I hope so that day never comes. Uh, right. But we understood the procedure uh, if that happens. Uh, so Neha is actually, um, uh, he, she mentioned here is that uh, the, her device is class A non-regulatory device, non-invasive uh, skin touch and pressure inserting uh, front stainless steel assembly back electronic part, electronic part. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, uh, they have tested with the electrical safety. What standards and manufacturing requirement with respect to manufacturing till selling we need to follow? So probably a standard for manufacturing requirement or uh, till they deploy the product or sell the product. Uh, what uh, what exactly they need to follow? Any right. standards? 
right. if again if you are in an industry that is not regulated uh, you no know, technically you may not have to follow any standard however you are taking a lot of a risk if you are not following uh, you know certain system again you don't have you may not need to be certified to a certain standard but definitely you should pay attention that you know are you creating a quality product again i cannot comment i i don't exactly know how this device could be class a but obviously you had regular your regulatory team assess the product and make the classification as class a my recommendation is make sure you follow at least uh, some discipline when you manufacture and sell the product as i said that you know compliance to the standard is good for your customers uh, potential buyers of your company your suppliers or when you go to your supplier saying that hey you know you really need to make a quality product because we are compliant with it could be iso 9001 uh, that for our uh, for our uh, uh, you know for our quality management system you know you have to show us the records of the, the testing of what you do for us uh okay so when she said non regulated in uh, so in india some of these things are still which are not uh, uh, are uh, going under the uh, mm -hmm. invasive basically so these are non regulated so probably they still have to follow qms if they want to uh, to Correct. maintain the standards so later on if uh, these instruments gets regulated they may have to even show some of the records of their how they are maintaining things uh, absolutely few records yeah, even even in regulated devices there are classifications for example in the us there is a class 1 which does not need as much documentation Uh, as class two, all our robots and imaging systems are class two, and some uh, devices that could be implants inside the patient, they are class three, and they need lot more documentation than class two. So even within regulatory devices, you know, it depends on what classification it is. And again, make the call based on the type of product you are selling and what level of documentation you need. Almost always, your regulatory person uh, will be able to advise. Got it, got it. So on the same line, I think uh, Abhinish Nayak. Uh, Uh, here uh, he asks question about uh, if uh, iso and ic is a prerequisite for clinical trial so i think we just discuss if uh, uh, if these standards are really required while you are going for uh, clinical trials right the question is you know in order to even go for a clinical trial you probably need to communicate with a government agency that you need an approval for clinical trials and always they are going to ask well uh, whatever you have created how do we know it's safe enough for a clinical trial that you know let's say that you are you are creating a, a like a, a widget a unit that you are going to ship for your clinical trial and here are the 200 units that you are going to ship how do we know that they were actually you know that they are ma manufactured correctly that do you have systems in place that will ensure that uh, all those devices are safe so yes even for clinical trials i think it makes a lot of sense uh, to actually go through at least some compliance with these standards the last thing you want is that you did a clinical trial somebody got harm and the news gets out that you know your clinical trial harm somebody and that could be a really tough situation to dig yourself out of correct right so i think in this case when you are going for clinical trial probably having the safety checks done through iec um, and uh, quality management maintenance right. that your organization will make uh, facilitate or uh, make more sense while you know get your reports or uh, clinical trial studies done and all that right mm -hmm. uh samir uh samir parihar here is um, mentioning about uh, you know the contract manufacturing uh, thing which we discussed so he's saying that uh, we get our devices manufactured by contract manufacturer Uh, mm -hmm. who is manufacturing non medical products as well so mm -hmm. in this case how we can get iso 13485 right so you are the you are getting iso 13485 not your supplier now that that is actually you know very common situation that even if you are a medical device manufacturer your supplier is not and that is you know you won't believe how common that is because our suppliers do like for example the computer that we buy you know our supplier who provides us the computer that goes in our robot that supplier is not a medical device manufacturer but as long as they maintain records of the units that they are going to ship you and you have the record of the testing that you do on those device or when you integrate those device that's good enough 
so it is your responsibility to get 13485 certification as long as you have documentation proof that you have a, you have a controlled way that you send your specifications to your supplier and what you get back you have a controlled way of testing it that's usually good enough right right so i think he was asking in context where he don't want to have a manufacturing facility at all uh, mm -hmm. so as in they just give that's probably it. designs and then get the thing back so i think samir uh, i hope your question is answered so in this case you'll have to maintain that thing at your uh, end as well uh, to be uh, you know quality management assured or something at your organization level right and also uh, you know if it's if 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 you are going to outsource all the contract manufacturing to this uh, supplier you know you definitely want to do supplier audits to make sure that they are doing what they said that they are doing hmm. right right uh, we have actually interesting question here can a core technical engineering uh, engineer learn mm -hmm. to do all required things for certification or is it safe to hire an expert to carry out all the necessary things um actually you know at least in my experience most of the times it is the core technical engineer who does all the required things for certification so i mean i for example i wrote all the test procedures initially when i did not have the team i wrote all the requirements i wrote uh, pretty much even some of the sops so yeah it's not not at all you know you can totally do it yeah, of course. So what usually we ask for, especially if it's an approval of a record or approval of a document, have at least two people do it. Or have at least two people review and approve. What you don't want is the same person who executes the test says that all the tests are done in a perfect way. Usually it helps, you know, just for pure sanity, it helps to have a second pair of eyes look at uh, test records. Okay, so the same, from the same organization, somebody else yeah, can, can review it? Absolutely. It's from the same organization, that's totally fine. Okay. Now, there are situations uh, when having a different reporting, well, especially once you are big enough, uh, it might help to have a different reporting structure for your quality engineers compared to your product development engineer. Just because then, you know, when the question comes for independent audit of your design history file, right? It's not done by the same people who create the design history file. It's done by somebody else. But, you know, those it makes sense to do this after you are big enough. Got it. Uh, Sanjay, it's already 5.03. Can we just extend for another 10 mm -hmm. minutes or so? Uh, I, that uh, maybe five minutes or 10 minutes five might minutes. be a little short for me. Sure, sure. Yeah. So we have two, uh, so we have a lot of questions. Probably what we can do is that we can take this question, uh, email it to you and uh, some of this question, if you could uh, answer sure. uh, over email as well, that can mm -hmm. also be. Uh, so I'll, I'll just take a couple of questions here then. Uh, can a single application be used to apply for hardware as well as software? So uh, is it, I'm not really sure what does it mean, but the single procedure can be used uh, or SOPs can be used for both hardware and software? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, for example, when you have an SOP on how to release a document, hmm. right? Who approves who, you know, where do you archive it? That document, you know, that SOP is applicable to both software or hardware. The question might be, Pranita, that, you know, if it's like uh, an application that is used for tracking different things, you know, again, yeah, it is it is possible to use the same application for hardware and software. Again, I can't really think, you know, what application would be used for both of those. It depends. You got it, got it. So we have another question from Tapas here. Is it important to maintain the yearly record of the forms or it could be three years or more for revision? Um, when you say forms, uh, um, maybe those what? SOPs while we are templates or something we are writing. Uh... Right. So no, the SOPs. So the way it works is you need to have a record of the review of the SOPs or the procedure. Now, just because you reviewed them does not mean that you have to change them. Right. Okay. So, the, for example, some of our SOPs have not changed for four years, and that's okay. As long as we say that, oh, here is the list of SOPs that we reviewed this year. And when you define the, the regular reviews per 13485, you can say that my annual review includes review of all the SOPs. And right. that you could have, here are my subject matter experts who looked at the SOPs and they think all is good. 
Darun, darun. Uh, I think two last question we'll take here. One is from Ankit. Uh, he's asking, does ISO 13485 2016 require an internal auditor to be certified by an ex uh, uh, internal auditor to be certified by an external agency or a certifications or notified body? So the I don't in, yeah I don't think your internal auditor needs to be certified by an external uh, agency. At the same time, you need to write down who is qualified to do your internal audit. And right. if you say that, you know, the person who is qualified to do internal or needs to be, for example, let's say needs to be trained on ISO 13485 and the evidence of training could be as simple as either attending a class or mm -hmm. just by reading and saying that, yes, I have read and understood such and such standard. But again, you know, uh, it's, it's really up to you. I don't believe that the internal auditor has to be certified. They need to be trained and you need to have a training record for those people. Right, right. So on the similar line, I think um, uh, Vignesh, who is making Class B IBD device, is asking, where can we exactly know all the documents to follow from where we can uh, form where to procure these documents, purchase them all from official website is too expensive, purchasing them and all that is too expensive. So how shall they start doing it? Right. Right. Uh, so if you are, I guess you are probably talking about the SOPs or the template SOPs. Yes. And if it is too expensive, um, uh, again, you know, either try to have funding to make it happen. And this is the classic question of make or buy. And what you are effectively saying is the buy part is too expensive. Then the only choice left is make. So you can write your own SOP. You are obviously taking some risk mm -hmm. when you do that and you are taking time away from what you would be doing otherwise. So that's the decision you'll have to make. So I think in that case also you can take also your help from fellow innovators or entrepreneurs Absolutely. as well who have already gone through the process probably they can share some of the templates or guide you if you are not able to uh, you know go for any kind of a consultant at this moment or something right. so that's yeah. another uh, advantage or you can also contact some of the incubators who are equipped with uh, handling this kind of a questions. Correct. Uh, I think there are many questions probably we'll have to stop here uh sanjay uh right. so yeah, yeah i have i have a hard stop unfortunately it's 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 actually i can see light outside so <laughs> you know and uh i have uh you know family commitment that i need to drop my kids sure. to yeah sure, so sure. yes i again do collect the questions uh send it to me Pranita. i will uh i'll make time to respond to them uh and it was yeah thank you um, again for the opportunity yeah please no, I'm just going to ask audience. We 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 find all your questions very interesting. If you could send it to us on sign iitb at uh, sign at the rate sign iitb dot org, uh, we can uh, actually forward those questions to uh, Dr. Sanjay, and then uh, we'll try and get an answer for them as well. So uh, I'll just put uh, an email address here so that you can write to us. And uh, we'll try and answer those things over email to you. Uh, Sanjay, actually, there is one more request uh, in the chat box about mm -hmm. sharing the PPT with audience. Uh, is it possible to share some of the slides um, or something with them? Yes, I will send them to you, Ranita, and then you can distribute them. Sure. So whoever would like to have the PPT as well, please uh, write to us. We can share a link with you as well. And uh, I probably uh, we'll, we'll conduct few more sessions on quality management system. So stay tuned with us. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay, for joining us and such an interesting talk. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks a lot. And I wish you guys a uh, good evening. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for joining this session. Thank you.